something I say on on the video, set yourself on fire and yeah. the world will come see you burn. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's John Wesley, man, one of the great evangelists. They asked him, you know, how do you grow your ministry? Everywhere you go, these people come and they said, man, set yourself on fire. The anointing, the passion, the thing that you most love to do, turn that up. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the scoreboard, the numbers and all that, the followers, the likes. Mm. Just turn yourself up, mm. doing the thing that you love to do, and the world will find you. Welcome, world. This is the Life Lessons by Motiversity podcast. Uh, your host, Tori Jones. We're here with the illustrious Billy Allsbrooks. Oh, my bad. Dr. Billy Allsbrooks. What's good, go. Billy? God is good. God is good, man. Good to see you, brother. Appreciate you having me yes, out here yes. in L.A. Without question. Welcome. The people have been amazing. Everybody's been showing us mad love out here. Oh, it's been amazing. It's been amazing, man. Nice. So we're just trying to get a lot of B-roll footage of the city mm. and um, tied into the tour, the 40 City Tour that we own. So oh, and it's, for, it's oh. awesome. Hold on, wait a minute. Four city tour. What what other city? Now we doing the top forty cities in the United States of America, the pop most populated cities. Man, we come in every single one. That so is, wow, is, some is, of the cities now they close together. For instance, Dallas Fort Worth, within thirty miles, that's one one show. But we doing the top forty. Yeah, we doing the top forty cities, population wise. Man, we bringing this word. We bringing this this uh, fire troop music, that's and we gonna nice, take it to the nice. world. The legacy that um. That I'm out to achieve and accomplish why I'm here is to impact one billion people positively. So that's what we're going to do. That's a beautiful thing. And I think this uh, this podcast, this show is uh, step one. So, Amen. Billy, so tell me a little bit about yourself, man. Tell me what makes Dr. Billy Allsbrooks, Dr. Billy Allsbrooks. How'd you get here? Man, um, I was in the music business 17 years, rap artist. I had songs on the radio, music producer, songwriter. Mm. On their personality, um, produced for a bunch of gold and platinum max, chasing what the world calls the Hollywood lifestyle, the okay, women, okay. the fame, sure. the money, sure. the accolades, all of that. And um, no matter how high I went in that business, it was always a void. And the higher I went, the bigger the void got, and I couldn't understand. Because the world tells us that's what success is. The nice car, mm, the homes, course, the money, of all of that. But it never seemed to... Quench the thirst that was on the inside, you know? Mm. And I couldn't understand why. Because I did everything they told me to do. You know, if you get the song on the radio, man, everybody loves you. Mm. You'll have, you know, loyal people. The money's there. The world bows down to you. It's all a lie. You so know? You, you checked all the boxes. You checked all the things in terms of having a record, having success on the charts. Right. You know, playing big shows right. in front of tens 20, of thousands 000 of people. people man. Okay, Crazy. got you, got you. So you had all these things, yet you felt a certain void. Walk me through your music career. So walk me through how you got to this point where you you became Billy Osbrooks, the motivational speaker. So well, tell me, take me through your music career. It uh, started out when I was young. My, my grandmother owned a music store for mm. 26 years teaching lessons. And my, my mother and father both at one time or another taught there at the, the store. All my aunts and uncles taught. Um, my mother had a master's degree in music. My father was in the uh, Alabama Music Hall of Fame um, as a studio musician. So when I grew up, man, music was everything around me. You know, I mean, it was a constant. Mm. Um, I started out playing drums, flirted around with some guitar, just some different things to find me. Got in high school, fell in love with the turntables, the DJing, so I got rid right. of the drum set and yeah, started beating yeah, yeah. on the drum machines. And uh, man, I loved it. I got a hold of the mic on the first move to Florida. Um, my sophomore year, and uh, where'd you move from? Moved from Dallas. I was born in Alabama yeah. originally, okay. and when okay. I was eight, a recession hit in the '80s. Yeah. We moved to Dallas, and oil was booming, so my my dad went out there. We stayed there until my mother got a transfer down in Florida. So my sophomore year, we moved there, and it was a totally different lifestyle. Gotcha. Down I, heard, I, heard, I heard the swing. I heard that accent. I'm like, where's that accent from? It's yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Okay, so that's gotcha. why you can't figure it out. It sound like a little southern, you know, Dallas and Miami, and down south, and all gotcha. that. Just gotcha. gumbo. Nice yeah, gumbo. Gotcha. You know. <laughs> but I went down there when I was uh, in my my sophomore year. Uh, a friend of mine had a DJ set up in his in his house, and he was kind of known around the area. Hmm. So in between one of the baseball games I was playing. We had this like four hour layover after after school. So we went over to his house and got on the mic for the first time, just playing around, you know, just doing little freestyles. We recorded it. Back then it was actually mixtapes, a real so, tape. Sure. Not, a tape. We yeah, say yeah, mixtape yeah, now, yeah, but it was actually a real, yeah. Press play, yeah, yeah. That was it. But um, 
we, we recorded it. I had a little entrepreneur in me even back then. I went home, made some copies, made five copies, went to school the next day, sold all five on me, five dollars a piece. Okay. So uh, I was like, twenty five dollars. So mom gave me ten dollars to sweep and do all these chores all week, bust me down, and I got twenty five dollars for doing this on one day. And today is Tuesday. I'm like, there's three or four more days of school left, right? So I went home, took that money, bought another ten pack of tapes. Went back to school the next day, sold them. So basically, the the old school selling out the back of the truck. Yeah, I mean, we weren't good, yeah, but yeah, people, yeah. Man, I knew how to sell. I was, you know, yeah, I wasn't yeah. that good. It was the first one we ever made, but mm-hmm. man, I was like, oh, there's some money doing something that you like to do. Of course. I'm like, oh, they couldn't tell me nothing. So from then on, man, in the music, me, me and music, and, and and the hustle and the grind, we 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 had a little thing together, mm. you know, and it showed me love and showed me favor. And I climbed the ropes from DJing. I got into DJing, you know, the excitement that I thought all the DJs have money, you know. They always portrayed on the mixtape they had money. So I was like, okay, I got to do like them and get mm-hmm. some money. Mm-hmm. Got over there. Then I realized the DJs didn't have any money. The only ones that really making money in the, in the music that time that was, you know, as far as independent, like we were with a, were, were dope boys. So from the get, from the get, and guess, the, the D-boys always are, are instrumental, so... Honestly, all styles of music, but especially I've right. seen the hip hop game, and especially down south. Right. Well, that's, that's where all the just, funding came from. Exactly. That was the bank exactly. in the streets, you know. So, essentially, when you got into the game, your objective was to make money. It's not right, like you right. were fame. To be like yeah. A backpack rapper. Oh bars, no, no, no. Poetic. Well, I mean, you know? I did, I did write though. I did like writing. I still, I mean, to did it today. I love one, the feel of a pencil mm. and a pad. I love to write. I love to express. You know, I was. Writing uh, raps all day in school, skipping. As soon as I got the rap done, I skip out, and go home, walk thirty minutes home, and record at my house. Yeah, yeah. And I had a little setup at the house. Started making them tapes. I'm like, man, they can't tell me nothing. I'm making money. You know, this one English teacher, she saw my talent. I didn't even know it was a talent. I was just, you know, whatever, scribbling on paper, writing these raps. And she said, I always see you writing in class. What you writing? You know, I said, Oh, I'm, you know, writing this, and I show her. She said, oh, you're writing poems. And I'm like, I'm writing raps. What you talking about, poems? She's like, no, these are poems. She's like, oh, I see what you do now every day. She's like, I tell you what, um, bring these things to me every week, and I'll give you extra credit. I'm like, credit for this? Mm. She's like, yeah. I was like, well, I'm going to use this at home, too, so I'm going to give it to you, but I need it back because I'm going to be writing when I get old. So I write these little raps down on paper. She credited me out. So that was kind of like the first one that actually you know, saw what I was doing. So that, what, you know, what, some, age, what age is this? That was like my junior year, sophomore year. Okay, you know. So you're you're already being incentivized for your poetry, basically. Like you know, you're yeah. you're doing these raps, and you are not on. You're not only obviously you know writing these raps, so then you can spit, so you can record, right, right. so you can then flip, so you can. And it didn't hurt with the ladies but either in high school. Also, obviously, you know what I mean. Not, they, oh, you not. got a microphone in your hand. You look so sexy. <laughs> the same ones that wouldn't show me. Uh, you know, wouldn't show me any kind you of uh, the, hey, attention. The basketball or microphone. Oh yeah. I, say, I play a ball too. My, my yeah. dream growing up was to play. Um, I'm from Alabama, so. College football is everything. Sure, sure. We had, we didn't have much in Alabama. It was just football, music, you know, and um, that was it for us. Football, and music. So um, my goal was to play for the University of Alabama. But as I was growing up, um, I just didn't grow tall enough. I was about five <laughs> six, you know. <laughs> I could play. Now I started every game that I that I you know had to cleat some, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I balled out. But you know the scouts ain't wasn't trying to hear that. You the know Crimson, what I mean? The Crimson Tide is a, is a different height. Yeah, different, 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 different thing. Different thing. <laughs> but I mean, I got some scholarships, to, you know, Division three stuff like that. That's but my same. heart was Bama. It was like Bama or die. You know, I didn't really have any desire to play anywhere. Honestly, I, I did not have. It was like one thing that was it. You know, yeah, when I got to about my senior year, I started realizing this that part wasn't gonna happen. But at the same time, rapping was happening. Like, I started getting bigger. The name got bigger. And then I started being known around the whole city there in Fort Lauderdale, Miami. And I was like, hmm, this is what I need to do. So I just transitioned out of chasing the football into full speed. I'm going to do this music thing. See, I never sat down and said, what, uh, what's the end outcome that I want? And see, most people don't do that. Mm. Like, they don't say, okay, when I get up every day, what, what do I want my life to look like? Like, what kind of environment in the music business do I want? You know, do I want the club life? Do I want the just studio life? You know, do I want pop music, rock music, um, gangster music? What is it? Who do I want to be around every day? I didn't ask those questions. Mm. Mine was like, I just want to get home, give me some money, let me get some women. Whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Just give me that. (laughs) So I did that. I wrote, because I could write these songs, these dance songs and strip club songs and gangster stuff. I could write them like nothing. It was easy for me. 
So I could spit them out all day, but I never asked that I want to be in that environment. Uh, so what happened is I got success. Like I had this number one strip club record and about drugs. I didn't even do drugs because my, my father was an alcoholic growing up. So I saw that whole life and the whole world and all my uncles um, had that addiction and, and, and my bloodline on that side. Mm. And I grew up and I was like, this is not going to happen to me. So I wasn't even using this stuff, but everyone around me was using it. So I ended up doing these songs and I'm in these environments that I have no desire to be in. I'm in clubs, 2,500 people, everybody high, everybody drunk. Last five um, shows I did, they shot up the place. Man, I'm talking about different venues. I went to did it, different cities. Five in a row? And they shot, yeah, five in a row. I was like, bro, I ain't trying to do this. Like, it ain't worth that. Like, I was getting paid good money, but I was like, this is not where I want to be. I yeah, wanted yeah. to be at the hard rock. You, you know you what I'm saying? Pop inciting music. Inciting riots. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but I never understood that though. See, I didn't yeah. have the knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge is what God exactly. say. Exactly. So I didn't have this knowledge that I needed to know, you know, write the ending first. Mm. You know, I read a um, story about this author and they said, you know, how are you so successful writing all these books? You know, what's your process? And he mm. says, I write the end chapter first so I always know where I'm going. See, and I didn't never do that. You know, I'm just like, what's today? Let's 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 make something for today. Sure, sure, and that's sure, it. Sure. I had such a short, you know, vision, a short um way of looking at things and um uh, paid the price for it, you know. But um man, I could grind. I back in back then I learned to grind the hustle um from the music business. Gotcha, you know, gotcha. that's where the streets and, and music collided. So, so then so then where so you're in the music industry, you have a success. The, except obviously the part where you're right. in the strip club and right, get right. shot up, but I mean it's still success, right? And you get to a certain point. What's that breaking point that made you just say, "All right, I'm getting out of the music game and I'm getting into another calling. I want to have a higher calling." Was there an aha moment? Was there some sort of like epiphany? Was there a time when you was in the club and it got shot up? And you was like, "I'm out. Like I'm not doing this no more." Like what was what was the thing that made you sort of turn the page? 2001, I moved from Miami. Orlando because Miami just got crazy. I mean, people shooting for nothing, mm. just all day, every day, drugs, gangs, all of that. So uh, we moved to Orlando, got out of there. Orlando was still a city, but just wasn't as crazy, you know. So I moved up there, and about the time I moved up there, I started reading. I, I got a hold of um, Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Right, right, right. And he started in there talking about you got to self educate yourself, you know, like they don't teach us the stuff you need. In school, this is why we struggle. And it started to make sense. Like, okay, that's why I'm, you know, I, I, I'm making money, but I can't keep it because I'm not investing in the right things. So I started reading um, his stuff and really immersing myself. And he stressed education, like personal self-education. Mm, right, not right, book, right. Not books. Like, yeah, yeah, but self-education. Right. You know what I mean? So, man, I've read everything I could get my hands on from, like, 2001 all the way to now. Like, I never stopped. Like, 2001, I'd be in the bookstore three, four hours a day. I'd go in the bookstore. I go to four or five different sections in the bookstore, like personal growth, psychology, um, religion, um, and art and music and things like that. So I'd have me like three or four different books. I'd just go to the shelf, pick something up, get my notepad out, hit my time on the phone, and read each book 20 minutes. So I'd yeah. kind of skim through and see what I wanted to do. You know, like whatever I wanted out of that book, I'd just kind of skim and say, okay, I'm going to start here, hit the thing, and I'd read 20 minutes, take notes. Now, I wasn't going to school. This wasn't for anybody. This is just for me. Yeah, it's not not yeah. academic knowledge. Yeah. Not not a curriculum where it's like, oh, you got to take uh, calculus or nah. some things that don't apply to anything in right. reality. Exactly. But just sort of the self education, the right. university of the world. So that's to speak, it. Right? That's it. Because I, I mean, everything I was reading, I was you know was touching me, resonating with me yeah, yeah. in some kind of way. So I was hungry. I was like, oh. And then the more I read, the more hungry I got. I'd be in there three or four hours. It's like you know, here's this, they named the table after me because I was in there so much. <laughs> you know, but. Here in the daytime, I'm in, I'm in the bookstore yeah. reading deep, you know, deep stuff. Like some of the most um, like, powerful and profound stuff ever if written. You, if you had, I mean, just not not to get off off task, but still on task. If you had three books that you would say like really impacted your life to who you are today, what would those three books be? Well, definitely Robert um, Kiyosaki. Rich, no, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Outside of the Bible, let's say, because that's okay. number one. But outside of that, um, we would say Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Of course. Um, Think and Grow Rich, mm. um, Science of the Mind, um, some other ones that really affect me. I always studied laws of 48, 48 Laws of Power, um, 33 Strategies of War, The Art of War, um, The Power of the Imagination, Never Could gotcha, Die, like gotcha. all these. I mean, that stuff just opened my mind up. Gotcha. You know? Gotcha. But I started reading these books, some of the most profound stuff ever written in the daytime. In the nighttime, I'd be performing in these clubs. 
with this ignorance that I was saying out of my mouth. You know what I mean? Like I just read wisdom, knowledge, strength, power, and I'm spitting garbage. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And, and they shooting up and they talking all this. And I'm like, I just read some of the best books ever. And then see what happened? I started pouring so much truth in me. Lies couldn't coexist anymore with mm. me. See, that's what I started. I poured so much truth in me. Got you. That you cognitive know? dissonance. Right. I didn't understand yeah. what I was doing, but this is the law I was tapping into because, sure. you know, truth is the chiropractor of the mind. And, and, and um, I, uh, lies and ignorance cannot survive in the environment of truth. And I started pouring so much truth in. That was all that was in me. So at nighttime, I'm having this tug of war going on now. Like what used to be okay for me to do and what I used to accept doing now was like, you know, this is foolishness. Yeah. You know, I see real people dying now. Like, you know, people I know dead and we go on to funerals. I'm like, hmm, got to reconsider this thing. You know, people going off 20 years. This guy gets shot. That guy got shot. This girl gets shot. You know, just craziness, man. I'm like, what are we really doing this for? You know, and on top of that, I was looking around. Not many people were really thriving. Even though it looked on the surface like people were thriving and successful, they really weren't. You know what I mean? Like, gotcha. there was only three or four rappers that could really even pay their bills with the stuff they were doing. Most of it was just check to check, you know, club to club. You spend most of it at the bar. Sure, it advances, rain. advances. You know, you buy a car, you buy a watch, you that's buy a it. chain, yeah. and, and that's it. And they you got you out. for 10 years, exactly. <laughs> 7 years, whatever. Exactly. So, I mean, it, you know, I started going through that struggle. And that last album I did was called Me Versus Me. Mm. And that was it. It was like, okay, the old me and the new me. Gotcha, you know, which gotcha. one's going to win here, yeah. you know? But uh, in December, what changed everything was my father passed away in front of me. I had oh. a blood clot, stroke, and um, passed away right in front of me. Unexpected. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, man. Sorry to hear that. You know, it's the worst day of my life to uh, see him die like that. But it was also the turning point and the preparation in the beginning of this, what I'm doing now. Had he not died, I wouldn't be here today. You yeah. know, he died in front of me, and it rocked me at the core. It made me look at my my life and my goals and my ambitions and everything. I really had to sit down for once and look at my life. Mm. Like most people don't want to look at their life. You ask them, what do you want to do in life? I don't know. Like, bro, you going through life and don't even know what you want. Like most people won't sit down and just ask, you know? And me, I hadn't been been doing that. I'd just been chasing what everybody else told me to chase. You know? But uh what what really changed it, the day after a couple of days after he died, the funeral director went over there to the Funeral home, funeral director said, uh, first he said, let me take you out and show you where I'm going to bury your dad. The plots, your grandmother bought floor plots. So my grandmother was still alive. We went out there. My granddaddy was, was gone already. He was in the ground. So the funeral director said, there's your granddaddy. Here's where your grandmother's going to be. Here's where your dad is going to be. And here's where you're going to be. Oh. Now, see, the day before, a couple of days before I seen my daddy die, Mm. Like, in front of me, struggle to die, like, 10 minutes, all of that. I seen the whole thing. So when he said, you're going to lay here, I understood what that meant. You know, I've been to funerals before, friends, all that. I right, right. really didn't get it. This one, I knew. When he said, you're going to be right <clears throat> here, this is where you're going to be, it was like a gong. Dang. My whole body was shaking. You know, I was like, ooh. Go inside. Funeral director says, uh, what do you want on your daddy's headstone? What do you want on in the obituary? I didn't, I didn't know what to tell him because me and my daddy never talked like that. He was in good health as far as I knew. So I'm thinking, you know, what would he want? You know, what do you want on there? But then I started transitioning back to, you're going to be right here. You know, like I was still, my mind was still out there. Yeah, yeah. And then I put two and two together. Well, one day they're going to say, what do you want on Billy's headstone? What do you want on his obituary? And that changed me because I'm like, if I was to die right now, what would be in... You know, what would be on the, the headstone and what would be in the ran? I was like, here lies a man that served himself, didn't care about anybody else, and chased money, women, fame, and that's all he cared about. Hmm. Didn't make a difference in nobody, didn't care about nobody except himself. And I was like, man, that's embarrassing, bro. I don't want my mom to read that. You know what I mean? But that was my life. I had to stare at it for once and be like, bro, this is where, how you been living. You know, this is what it is. And then a day or two later, went to the wake. And my father's laid out, and um, people coming up and talking to you know about him. So my father didn't tell me a lot of a lot of stuff that was going on. See, he was he was an alcoholic. My senior year, my mother divorced him. And the day she divorced him, he never drank again. He'd been drinking thirty something years, could not control it. The day she divorced him, that was it. He had a why, mm. a real why, you know, which was to get his family back. 
So he never drank the last 15 years of his life. He'd go around to prisons and uh, recovery centers and all that and help these guys get off what he was addicted on. Well, these people got up there and started talking about my father. They was like, your daddy came and got me on the side of the road at 2.30 in the morning when nobody would come get me when I was drunk. No one said, your daddy can't bail me out at 4 in the morning when my family turned it back on me. Another one said, me and my wife was at the kitchen table about to file for divorce, had the paperwork right there. And your daddy said, don't do it. It's 10 years later, we're still together. So I was listening to this stuff, and what I didn't hear, because I'm observing, I'm like, I didn't hear anybody say anything about money, cars, rims, making it rain. Mm. It wasn't like your daddy got good rims. Nobody got up there and said that. You know, like, oh, he was blinging, you know, or, man, boy, your daddy sure didn't make it rain. You know what I mean? Like, nobody said this stuff. And I'm like, man, this is what I've been chasing. Nobody mentioned none of that. Yeah, yeah. All it was was Realize a man with great rims. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all it, all people were saying was yeah. what my daddy had done for them, and I realized that was the real net worth is how much you saw to other people. Course, that's the only course. thing our real value is is how much so, we're contributing. Legacy. Yeah, yes. legacy. That's exact. That's the exactly the word. I realized from that point on, my life it was all about legacy and the legacy I wanted to leave. Now I didn't know what that was. Now see, I just got out of the music and that been consuming my whole life, seventeen years, and I was just one focus. And now I'm a man with no focus. Except I know that it needs to be greater than the one I had before. You know, like the legacy, it, it needs to be yeah. something rooted in something real. Mm. You know, the you know, rapping was like half truths, everybody half faking, half truth, you know what I mean? And it sounds like too, like with your rap career, you are very much like it, it, you were trying to just get in where you fit in. So like you were just trying to find like whatever niche you could find to like blow up essentially. Like exactly. it wasn't based on anything that was like some sort of urgent thing right. you wanted to say to the universe. Right. To Until the, the very end. That yeah. Me Versus Me album, I started dabbling in it. Got you, got but you. at that point in time, I didn't have enough why and enough gas in my mm. tank to keep doing it and yeah, pursuing yeah. it. You know, like that, that, that last album, I really started saying, you know what, man, I'm tired of doing them kind of records, you know? And the record that blew up, the one in Cali, I wasn't even going to put it on my CD because it was a real record. Mm. It was real. Like what I was saying, because um, at, the, at the time, man, um, I had been running around on the wife being in that, in that music life, you know? And I came clean in the song. I was apologizing. It's called Right Here. You know, I'll be sure, right sure, here sure. and apologizing for what I did. And it was real. Like it, every word, I did every word, yeah, and yeah, it yeah. was real for the first time. Like everything, it wasn't no faking. I wasn't trying to make it sound pretty. I wasn't making it for anyone else but her, right? So... I had like 40, 50 songs done and was trying to figure out what's going to fit on the album, the mixtape. And um, I liked it, but I was like, I don't want to put that out there because it's personal. It's so vulnerable. I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable if I put that out there. You know, but that's the point of music. Yeah, but yeah. I hadn't discovered that you're supposed to be vulnerable in the thing you do. I hadn't discovered that yet because uh, we from the streets, like you don't show vulnerability. Right, like, right, yeah, you know, right. we'll, I'll give you a little bit of me. But there's always going to be this, you know, I can't let you in all the way, but you can wild. have access. Be this, yeah, this yeah. Side. yeah, for yeah. sure. So I remember, remember going on, playing the, for a couple, couple of my homeboys, trying to figure out what song. And one of the guys heard it, and I just cringed, because they put the tape in, I mean the CD, and push play. And are you, I'm, are you I'm, singing? Are you singing on it too? No, no. Nah, nah, oh, okay. I got another guy singing the hook, but, gotcha. but he's, you know, he puts it in, and I'm cringing in the back, because it's a real record. I'm like, mm. man, he's hearing my whole life right there. You know, they, he knows my wife and all the stuff I'm talking about. So I'm mm. feeling uneasy, because it's the first time I'd ever really been real, like totally real, yeah. you know? Like I showed the vulnerabilities in the... In the weak side, not just what we wanted to portray to everyone. This is the first record, man. We got done with it, and he's like, man, that, that record was kind of, he's like, you sure you're going to put that out? Because he felt the same way I did. Like, yeah. it was real. And I was like, okay. I, you know, I knew the way he was saying it, that it was something to it. I was like, played it for another guy. We riding down I-95 in Miami. He's got his girl in the car. He's in the front. I'm in the back. And he gets to this song, and I'm like, oh, God, they're going to play this song. Man. So I'm sitting in the back like, oh, I'm be vulnerable, right? Plays the song about, you know, halfway through, his girl started crying. And he don't know what's going on. He pull over to stop. Like, what's happening? And she had connected with the song. Mm. And he goes, I don't know what, but, but you got a song right there. If you make her do that, you got one. Yeah. So I put it on my CD, like, track number 23, like, at the back. Because, he, again, I was scared. Ooh. Back in the day when yeah. I was to have, like, 30 tracks. <laughs> well, this is a mixtape. So I just, you know, you chop it up. You know? <laughs> but it's, like, 23. Right. And it should have been number one because it was the only real one on there. You know what I mean? But this is, I'm discovering what I, what I do now. Fire Truth Music, what I call. But, you know, it's being vulnerable, being passionate about what you do, and then packaging up yourself in a way that the world can receive it, you know? Gotcha, gotcha. And that was the beginning of, like, okay, 
it's okay to be you. And they'll reward you for you. Mm. You know what I mean? But at the same time, I still didn't have enough left in the tank, man, to keep doing the music the way I was doing it. You gotcha. know, so I laid it down after that. You so know? you said you retired, put the jersey up in the rafters. What was the thing that got you into the actual motivational speaking thing? Like right. actual, what was your first gig? What was your first, like, let's focus on that part of your All career right. now. We definitely, we got the music part. Now Billy Allsbrook's moving forward. Like, See, what's the... Man, I went through that whole thing and my father passing away. And uh, I was ready to find my call and my thing. But before I could do that, I had to go through the struggle. You know, when my father died the way he did, it caused PTSD in me and panic attacks. Of course. So for the next seven years, I struggled with this inner war. I lost everything that I had put up in music, my name, the fame, the money, the, all of that. It was like a debt by a thousand cuts. You know, I was working and stuff like that. I had all these businesses and, you know, mixed city stores, urban stores. Like I had all that spreading out, you know, from the hustle, from the game. I kept those, but I couldn't manage them and run them right because I was having these panic attacks. Like I'd go to work, sit there for an hour and then run home because I had a panic attack. And I would go to hospital 12 times in nine months thinking something was, you know, happening to me. I'd get there and they'd be like, nah, you okay, you just having a panic attack, whatever, they send me back home. And come back the next time, oh, here come Billy. Like I'd been there so many times they knew my name. Like mm -hmm. here comes Billy, you know? But uh, I went through the struggle for seven years, man, the worst, struggle in my life. It was dark because nobody can get in your mind and help you fight but you, you know? I could go to therapy, um, the wife, the mom, everybody helping and all that, but still I had to win that battle, the battle of the mind. What, what would you say got you over the hump? Was it therapy? Was it a combination of things? Like what was the sort of like tipping point to get you to a good place? It's kind of ironic because two days before my, my father had that yeah. stroke, I, I got this book called The Prosperity Bible mm. and it had like 19 classic, like, think and grow rich type of material from right. back in the era. Right, right, right. And I was like, man, I'm going to master my mind. I was like, I heard about all this power of the mind stuff. I'm going to master my mind. Two days later, I lose my mind. You know, that's, that, that's, that's how it goes. But sometimes you have to lose yourself before you find yourself. You know what I mean? So I, I, I set on the journey to find myself but didn't realize that's what was happening. You know, so for seven years, man, I, I went through this struggle. Um... Got some therapy. I went to like six, seven different therapists before I found the right one. I found a young guy just out of school, six months out. But he was passionate mm. about therapy and helping people, not just for money, not just trying to get me in there for another hour. But nothing really changed until I was going around the block one night because this is what I used to do when I get these panic attacks. I start walking around my neighborhood, like a mile-long square block. So every time I got all these, you know, the panic attacks would begin to rise in my, on the inside. And I knew at this point that's, that's what it was. I wasn't yeah, dying. Yeah. I was just dealing with this panic attack. So I'd put my shoes on and I'd go out there and walk. Because all this energy's on the inside of me and you can't get it out, you know. So I'd go out there and walk and start talking to God, you know. I started yelling at God, you know, crying to God, numb to God. You name it. I went through every emotion you could go through. Mm -hmm. Just me and him because there's nobody else at this point. Nobody can fix it. So I look up to him and I say one night, I say, everything's gone, my money's gone, all of the names gone, all the friends gone, all of that. It's just me. I ain't got nothing else to give you. I tell you what I'll do, I'll make a deal with you. I said, if you heal me, I'll go out and tell the world who did it. That's all I got. And I think that's all he needed was me to invite him in and say that. And as soon as I did, then I began, the thing started moving slowly. It wasn't no, like overnight, right, right, right. but things, you know, the therapy began to get better. I started understanding what the therapist was telling me. I started getting revelation, and then slowly, slow. I'm talking about years now. This Man, this was so hard for me because I was so wired in music that, you know, in these short month, three-month intervals, you put a record out, you got to get it in three months. You know, you got to get everything you can get off that record and then move to the next one. And this wasn't happening that way. This was like, okay, three months went by, no change. Six months, change, no change. A year, no change. Two year, no change. Three year, no change. And you get to the point, you're like, this is the rest of your life, bro. This ain't going to never get better. You know, I got to that point. I was like, it might not ever get better. This might, the good days is gone. And this is what it looks like. You know, you are a person with no clear purpose in life because I got out of music. You got no drive. You, you know, you don't know who you are. You're sick. All the people gone. No one to talk to. Nothing. You just, you and God. That's a lot of people. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Man, it was a struggle. The struggle is real, but 
So is the God to help me overcome it. So, man, he started delivering me and moving me and moving me and moving me piece by piece. Um, I started going to this men's group at church because I was trying to get over these panic attacks. And I'm like, I need as much help as I can get. You know, I'm in church every time they open the doors. I'm in therapy every time they open the doors. I'm reading about the mind every day, trying to figure this out on my own, going to this men's group. And um, I'm in there for a while until one night this guy come up to me, the guy who ran it. And he's like, hey, uh, can you teach next Monday? I'm like, uh-uh, not me. Um, no, I ain't getting up there and talk in front of everybody. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. I've been rapping in front of everybody. You know, there's always music and choreography and all that kind of stuff in front of 20,000. But to stand up there for, you know, an hour, hour and a half with no music, everybody quiet and just focused on you, I'm like, mm-mm. Not me. That ain't my life. That ain't my calling. I, mm, I ain't got no nothing for that. You know what I mean? But he kept on. He kept on. He was like, man, I need you. I need you. I need you. And I was like, for some reason, I said, okay, I'll do it. So all week, man, I prepped and prepped and prepped and was nervous. You know, mm-hmm. get up there. Mm-hmm. I get up there that night on that Monday night. And I say, first thing I say, I say, God still moves. And it was like an explosion went off on the inside of me, man. Boom! Like a nuclear bomb. It's like I turned into Superman. And I started talking and the words started popping just and the crowd was moving. And I'm like, where that came from? Yeah, yeah. You know, like it, you know, and people were vibing and it, it never got like that before. Hmm. And I spoke two hours in there, and nobody left on a Monday night. And we talk about nine o'clock, people go home, right? We stayed another hour after. And then I went in the parking lot, and it was just like the energy was there. So when I got home, I told my wife, I said, I don't know, but I stumbled onto something. I ain't never felt like that. I said, I've been behind the mic, you know, for 17 years and never oh. felt like I did over there. I don't know. You know, I didn't know what it was. I just knew the energy was different. So I knew something was up. And so this is the end of 2015. Mm-hmm. So now it's 2019. You're about mm-hmm. to go on a 40 city tour. Mm-hmm. So like that's that is I mean and like you said you were grinding in music for mm-hmm. like from back selling out the right. back of the trunk quote unquote you know what right. I mean like you were grinding for like you said seventeen years of music right. it got you to a certain place mm-hmm. now it looks like within three years three and a half mm-hmm. years you are in a place that is wildly expansive that there is right. no actual cap to it right. because obviously you're doing your calling take us through kind of quickly take us through that. Like, how was that evolution going from this point in 2015 mm-hmm. when you're doing a sermon, when you out mm-hmm. in, front, in front of everybody at the church, mm-hmm. and then so now you are motivating people, whether they are Muslim, Christian, religious. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Not religious, but you're motivating people. You're stirring a fire mm-hmm. them to, you know, tell us how you got there. Well, 15, I was back and forth. You know, every every couple months I would do, do a lesson over there. Um... 16 comes around summer, and the guy can't teach at all in the summer. And he's like, can you do the summer? Now, it was going to be 13 weeks that I was going to teach. I was like, 13 weeks? I'm going to thir- come up with 13 messages, mm. you know? I'm like, I don't know about that, I said. But, you know, something in me, the spirit was like, you know, God gave you the opportunity to take it. And, you know, what you doing? You know you're supposed to do that. Something I say on, on the video, set yourself on fire and yeah. the world will come see you burn. Yeah, you yeah. know, that's John Wesley, man. One of the great evangelists, they asked him, you know, how do you grow your ministry? Everywhere you go, these people come. And he said, man, set yourself on fire. The anointing, the passion, the thing that you most love to do, turn that up. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the scoreboard, the numbers and all that, the followers, the likes. Mm. Just turn yourself up doing mm. the thing that you love to do, and the world will find you. We, we do too much scoreboard watching. Yeah. We got to buy into the process. The process that mm. puts points on the scoreboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you watch over there all the time, what will happen is if it's not happening quick enough as the way you think it should, mm. you'll get into your emotions, and your emotions will affect your activities today that will actually put points on that scoreboard. So you have to stop looking over there. Keep your mind on the process. Yeah, buy right. in. Like, if I do the right things day in and day out, eventually I'll be in position to win. Right, right, you right. Know? If I plant enough apple seeds, an apple tree is going to grow with apples on it. I don't need to say, well, is it grown yet? No, I just keep planting, <laughs> keep watering, <laughs> and that thing will, and thing will happen, you know? Nice. So 16 comes, I do this summer thing. And I'm like, the entrepreneur kicks into me. You're going to be doing, every, every, every two hours I did, hour and a half I did of a presentation. I did 10 hours of study. So I'm like, man, 13 weeks, that's 130 hours. So I'm like, okay, you're doing all this research and inside you've been thinking about doing this book. 
why don't you just take what you're going to teach and formulate it in a book? And while you're studying, you're doing two things at once. And the entrepreneur, that's the entrepreneur in me. Sure, I say, sure, okay, sure. Yeah. that makes sense. Mm. So I wrote Blessed and Unstoppable my book during that summer at 16. The end of 16, um, I started getting burnt out in my other business. I had um, some cell phone accessory stores at this point in time. And I'm like, I just burn out in it because I wasn't connected personally with that. I'm used to writing and being a producer and pouring me into something, and there was nowhere for me to be in that. So I'm like, as soon as I get this book finished, I'm done. Mm. The, the week I finished writing that book, I got out of that business. Now, I didn't know what I was jumping to. I didn't know where I was going. It wasn't like, okay, a big opportunity open up, so I'm going to lead this and go to that. So, okay. I didn't know. I just had to step out in faith. See, every time that something really happened to me in my life, I didn't know what was going to happen, and I just had to step out in faith. If I had to see everything before it happened, I never, it never really happened. But those times that I said, you know what, Lord, I don't see anything, but I'm going to step out here anyway and just trust that you got me on the other side. And every time I did that, man, son, he do something amazing. You know, 17 comes around, the beginning of 17, and Instagram's got these little one-minute clips you can do video and audio, sure, right? Sure. So I started talking to my buddy Frankie. Um, I was like, man, you know those motivational video stuff? Man, I think I could do that because I'm a music producer, and I'm hearing these guys. I'm like, the stuff they saying don't blend with the music they putting it over. You know, as you know, mm. most of these guys were just doing um, speaking live or something like that and didn't have the music with it. So when you put music with it, it didn't really fit. You'd have them going up in the vocals, the music going down. It wasn't married together. Right, and me as a music producer, I'm like, mm. you know, that kind of stuff used to bother me as a music producer. So I'm like, I bet I could do that. I'm not sure, but I bet I could do that. So I tried this little one minute clip. It's on the the first video on on YouTube. I did. You can go back and, mm. and check. I just threw a Drake the Drake energy beat on there. Yeah, yeah, I did this one little minute freestyle on fade. I didn't have nothing written. I said, I just want to see what I sound like on the mic. Preaching, teaching, motivating, stuff like that. Not rapping, but just speaking. Sure, like, sure, I never yeah. heard myself do that. So I didn't know if the tonality would work, if my, you know, delivery on the mic doing this would work or not. So through the beat on, you know, just, through, you know, talked about faith a little bit, about believing. And I, you know, I went to Frank, I said, man, I think it'll work, bro. I was like, you know, I got some work to do. I got to mold the craft. But I think, you know, I got the tools to do it. I know gotcha. as a producer how to do it, and I think I got the voice to do it, and I'm reading, and I'm studying. So this is the preaching. first time yeah. that you've seen yourself in this different lane, basically. Well, I still didn't see it like I'm yeah. finna go out and do what I do today. Yeah, like, yeah. It, was, I, it was like little piece by piece was being revealed, and I didn't understand what was going on. You know, around, I think it was the third third month or fourth month, in 17, I bumped into Motiversity online. We, we we talked. He was, you know, very small at the time, like 20-something thousand, 25,000. Mm, yeah. And I had like 200 followers, not even. And those were all family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody yeah, was yeah. listening to me. And I'm like, man, I was like, you know, I, I want to, you know, do this motivational thing. Let's partner up. And he's like, oh, man, I've been looking for speakers. This, like, I was one of the first ones that we, we partnered up with, true, man. So and and um, shot him over some stuff, man, and it did good on his channel. And he liked it. I like. I was like, man, this dude got a nice thing. So, you know, from then on, I started feeding him um, stuff for the channel. Started doing my own and um, started growing a little bit. But I still didn't know, like, hey, this is a profession. This is really what you call to do. This is how you're going to change the world. I didn't get that. The money I had um, from closing that business at that time, things started getting tight because I left the business not knowing what I was jumping into. Now months is going by and I hadn't found really the, the stream yet, the money stream. Um, just wrote the book, just got it back in my hand. Right, now right. March, I got it back in my hands. I finished and I got the book back in my hand. So uh, me and my wife, we, we, we kind of getting into it about money. Money, you know, the enemy likes to squeeze you. So if he, you know, if he can put stress on you financially, whatever, get you fighting and bickering or whatever, get you, get you to break focus. You know, broken focus is the number one reason for failure. Mm. So if he can shake me and get me off this thing that I'm about to change the world, he, he better get me now. Like, let's uproot it before he gets rooted, right? So me and my lady are arguing about this stuff all the time, and the, the enemy's kind of getting in her mouth. She don't know what she's saying, but the enemy getting in her mouth trying to kill this dream that God put in me. Right, right, right. And, uh, you know, like, won't you just get a nine to five and be like everybody else? And, you know, you got to be realistic, you know, talking all this kind of stuff. And I'm arguing with him, like, no, this dream is in me. I'm not, you know. So I'm at this tug of war. I'm at this point, this crossroad, okay? Mediocrity, nine to five, every day living over here, the big dream that God put in you over here. Which one am I going to choose? I come to this fort. And we, I remember we got into this big argument one night. I was so angry because 
my life was not reflecting on the outside what I was on the inside. I had poured all this truth in me, all this stuff, all these dreams, and I knew what to do, all this stuff, but it wasn't, re- you know, nothing was showing up. Mm. I'm like, where's the money? Where's the, where's the breakthrough? Where's the understanding, my calling, all this? I don't know. Like, what, what's going on? And I remember going in there one night, turning on record on this, on this uh, track I was doing, and I started just yelling at the mic. I was born a champion. Raised a champion. Mm-hmm. I got champion in my bloodline. All I ever be is a champion. I started talking because I was having to remind myself because I'm hearing this noise and the enemy saying, you, you know, you're not going to be back in the rap days. You ain't going to be nothing. This is the rest of your life. And, and you got to be realistic and the money's not coming and the enemy's trying to get me in every angle. But I knew my identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it. At this point in time, I was like, no, 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 no. This, this, this ain't happening. I'm not going to choose that route. I'd rather die doing this thing right here than live that life over there. Mm. So I got on that mic and I started just, <clears throat> and for one time, I just started really letting me out. Yeah, like yeah. I wasn't just saying motivational things. I began, and that song wasn't for anyone else. That, that track wasn't for anyone else. It was me. And if you listen on it, I say inside the mind of a champion. I go back and forth on this on this um, video, on this message, and it's real stuff. It's it's my wife. It's the enemy, and 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 it's like, why don't you be realistic? Uh, God said, I'm the head and not the tail, above not below. I'll lend the many nations and I'll borrow. Like, why don't you get a nine to five? Do you really believe that stuff <laughs> you're saying? I say, I believe, you know, and I, and yeah, I would go so back and forth. You're shouting down. You're shouting down. Yeah, and I just say, yeah, and I just like, put it on there exactly the way it was going. Yeah. People didn't understand what was going on, but I was saying this inside the mind of me. It was. You know, these two voices going on. So, like, I wasn't really putting it out to, you know, do what I thought, you know, what it ended up doing. Mm. Ended up doing millions, millions of views. Other channels got on millions. Motorverse, it got so, 1.4, so, or whatever, something yeah, like that right yeah, now. Yeah. Well, when we put that video out, book took off. Book started selling. Because now, like, it's circulating, and now they're coming to me, and now all of a sudden, boom, hold on. The book is, like, jumping. Mm. Like, every, you know, then my channel started growing, and then, you know, I started realizing one night I was in there on the mic, and something just snapped. I was just like here, sitting in front of the mic, you know, about to push record. Something in my spirit came to me and said, behind this mic, you can change the world. Now, see, in rap, all the music that I had rapping, behind the mic, it was I could change my world. That wasn't the voice. It was you could change the world by what you say. Because when I was going through my struggle, going around that block, like I was telling you earlier with the panic attacks, I was listening to motivational stuff back then. It was pouring in me. And it all became clear when I got behind that mic that night. I'm sitting here and they said, you could change the world behind this mic. You know who the other person is on the other side of this thing. You've been the sick one out there. You've been the one that didn't have any hope. You've been the one down and out and didn't have dollars. And everybody turned their back on you and you were sick and lost. You know that person because that was you. Get on this mic and speak to you back four years ago when you didn't know anything. And sow life into that person because that's who's listening on the other side. Mm. So I understood it was a responsibility. It wasn't just about me like getting on and like making money like a rap. It's like, no, the words you say got power and going to affect these people. Because the people that hit me now, like when I first got it started in that, I thought I was speaking to people that just wanted to, you know, like be successful. Like, sure. that's not who hits me every day. The people that message me every day. Now, there's an element that people want to succeed in life. But the people that hit me every day was, you know, I just got diagnosed with stage four cancer. And I need your kind of stuff. I listen to you every single day to get me through these chemo treatments. Another one said, man, I just lost everything. And I'm going to prison. About to lose my mind. But I listen to you every day and you keep me going. Another one from prison, they write me five page, ten page letters, man. I'm in here listening to you right now, you change me in here. Like stuff like that. And I realize, okay, hold on. It's not the the you know, the financial part and the entrepreneurial part and the capitalism part. I get that. You know, that's an element. But I'm speaking to real people hurting. I'm speaking to people fighting for their lives, not just fighting to be successful, but fighting to live. Mm. So when I get behind that mic, I'm like, I take it real serious. You know, it's not just about me saying, y'all, keep your head up. You know, I'm not Ron Howard and this ain't happy days. You know what I mean? Like, the struggle <laughs> is real, but yeah, I'm there to yeah. tell them, the same God that healed me will heal you. You just got to buy in and believe. He's not going to give up on you. And I realized that I got to be the warrior behind the mic for the ones that can't fight. Mm. See, when I was out there on the street, I couldn't fight. You know, everything was gone from me. I didn't have anything in me. You know, I speak... For that person. I stand in the gap for that person. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is where I began to understand my identity and who I was. And when that when that thing took off and went, 
you know, millions. And then other videos did the same. Books started selling. And then each, you know, as I went along the way, it became clear, this is what you've been called to do. This is different than rap. This is not you. It's not your own ability. Because you know you're not that good, Billy. <laughs> I remember you on the block. You're not that good, Billy. This is me. This is God doing that. You understand what I'm saying? So I just, I just give it all to him and say, use me however you want to use me. Put me in and let me do what you designed me to do. Because the good thing about it is I never felt more alive than when I'm still in life over these other people. Rapping, I felt good because I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm doing my thing. It's all me, me. But I didn't feel like that. I didn't feel like the same way I felt when I could see somebody over there struggling, man, you know, about to give up and commit suicide. And then they hear something and like, okay, I don't need to do that. And they hit me, man, I was about to kill myself. I had somebody hit me the other day, just got out of the ambulance. My wife died. Can you, can you give me something? Man, I need it. Can you give me a word or something? Like these are the people that hit me. Yeah, yeah. So it's like that we in war. This stuff we do is not just like oh we making some cool videos, motivation. Nah, bro. There's some people on the other. You know, it's a pack to be yeah, thrilled. It's, 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 it's crazy. It's really, it's. I've seen it in my time with Motiversity and just seeing yeah. sort of some of the videos that I've planned and reading the comments and seeing how people really react to them and like right. knowing that hundreds of thousands of people are watching this right. and it's really hitting them deeply. So, I mean, definitely. Bro, and for I, everyone that write, there's powerful. probably 10, 15 that didn't that write. That didn't write. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, just to kind of wrap it up. So, two things. So, what would you tell yourself, your 20-year-old self? So, like, where you are now, all the hindsight that you have, what would you say to your 20-year-old self? I'd say the message I'm preaching now, man, you know, God still moves and, and do fire troop music. And what I mean by fire troop music, you know, um, fire is do the thing that sets you on fire inside that makes you feel the most alive. Mm. You. Like, the one thing that God made you to do, the things that excite you, um, inspire you, energize you, do that. Whether it's a relationship, be with the one that sets you on fire. Mm. Not the one that you look warm on, the one that sets you on fire. If you're going to have a relationship with God, let it be one on fire. You know, mm. if you're going to do work, do something that you can give your time, um, energy, and resources to that you were proud to do. You know? Then the truth aspect, which I never adopted in rap. You know, truth, as I wear it today, truth is the couture for greatness. Mm. There's no real success. You know, no next level without truth. You know what I mean? So, like, tap into that. Just be you. Be authentic. If you can't be authentic with someone, then they probably don't belong around you. You know, if, if you know, you just got to surround yourself with people that will keep it real with you and that you can keep it real with them, that won't judge you, that will allow that communication where you can just, you know, bond and say to the world, this is who I am. Like it or not, this is me. I want everybody around me. Um, to have that kind of mentality, man, that they can be themselves with me, that I'm not going to judge it, you know, because if you judge, people won't bring to you. Of course. I want somebody that I can do the same with, too, you know. If if the relationship with God, keep it real. He already know. Mm. So let's be true. Let's be. Let's have that relationship. When I come to God, I'm straight up, I say, this is my flaw. This is what I'm thinking. He already know anyway. So keep it real. You know, with the marriage, the spouse, the girlfriend, soulmate, whatever, keep it real from That's the get-go. See, big. I had so many relationship struggles because... All the way through the, through the mix, I never was able to really be me because I was scared to say me. I was scared to be vulnerable in front of people. You know, to, to, to have the kind of connection and the depth and the, and the relationships you want, you have to be able to be vulnerable. And most people get in these relationships where one could be vulnerable and the other one don't of trust course, it. Of course. Yeah, you know. And but that's so, big, though. What you said yeah. before is just sort of uh, tapping into that fire. Yeah, and fire truth. And then the music aspect. Now, when yeah. I say music, I don't mean like I did music. What I mean, music is just vibration. And we're all vibrating in something, right? Success is a, a certain frequency. Mm. You know, relationship love is a certain frequency. So what I'm saying by music is find your frequency that God wants you to vibrate at. Mm. Package up yourself. Music is, you know, like the packaging. Package up yourself in a way that you can deliver value to the world. This is my music. Like when you walk in the room, mm. you, you might not say anything. There's music playing when you walk in. I either mm. like that music or I don't. It's like, right. yeah. But like, Jit got a cool vibe. You know what I mean? Like, the music is cool. I like it. Or yeah, you can yeah. be like, man, something wrong with you. I don't feel good around. The music ain't right. You feel <laughs> me? You don't know what it is. So what I'm saying is you're fire, hit, true hit the wrong music. Chords. Exactly. Hit the wrong chords. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay, so last, last thing. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question, but what are you doing now? So the whole 40 City Tour, so just mm -hmm. explain that. And then big picture. Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself in five years? The, uh, the the corporate question, but where do you see 
yourself in five years. So just real quick, you know, just explain sort of like, you know, what's popping right now. There's a media tour and then. Okay. Yeah. We're we, we going to bring the Blessing Unstoppable Seminar Tour to uh, the top 40 cities population wise in the United States. Yeah. We're going to take this message, Blessed and Unstoppable. And um, we're going to inspire, motivate, educate, empower, teach people how to be the best version of themselves. We're going to teach them five troop music. We're going to teach them how to be what God designed them to be. And we're going to give them tools that they can actually use to go out and do it. The 40 biggest cities, and you're doing that right now. You're right currently now. on that tour. Yeah, we got the first um, five uh, cities, L.A., Chicago, New York, Houston, Phoenix. Boom. And that's the top five cities in the United States. Of course. Now, that took a lot of faith. You know, because we we start now, we're still at a level, we're still building this thing. Mm. You know, like we're still in the infant stages the way I see it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is still infinite. You know, I mean, infant um, stage to me. Sure. But I'm like, I teach this message all day, dream big, because with God, all things are possible. And if you're not at a place where you have to have God in the situation in order to be successful, then you're not dreaming big enough. You know, I want to invite him in. I want to say, well, I need to stretch beyond me. If I can do it, then my goal set too low. You know, set your goal, not to the, your own ability, but to that of the God that you serve. So I'm like, man, let's go do it. God will God bless this thing. Mm. You know, if we step out in faith, God will take care of the rest, man. So um, he put the vision in me and uh, we laid it out for the cities, man. We're coming. You yeah. know, and to me, this is the first leg. See, um, when I was in music, it was all short term, short term, short term. Now I'm like, no, 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 no. Five years. What do you want? You know, five years. Like you talk about yeah, five years. I'm thinking years. five years now, like longer timelines. Like, in five years, where I want to be. Where this, you at in five years? Yeah, this tour yeah. right here is to lay the foundation. Okay, we're doing, you know, venues two, 400 size, right? We come back, we're going to, hopefully, we're we going for the arenas, man. We're we coming after one billion people. God put this in me, one billion people. Not 999 million, 999,000, whatever. It's one billion. We're coming for it all. Is so, there somebody that's, like, already the hip-hop, Joel Austin? That's what I see in your future. If I had a crystal ball, I'd be like, you're kind of the hip-hop that's how you say his name, Austin? Austin, Austin, Austin yeah. Yeah, I'm really yeah. checking for him. But like, hip hop Joel Austin. Like, that's how yeah. I see you. Just like, you seem to, you know, you're so passionate about what you're saying. And obviously, you know, the amount that you've blown up in the last couple of years is kind of only a matter of time for that. That's kind of just yeah. that's my, my crystal ball. But what do I know? Well, that, that's, that's in the cars, man. I, I see it in my mind, you know. When in 2009, when I was having a panic attacks, I was actually at Joel Austin's church sitting up in the balcony there. This is going to be a good story when I get on that stage. Because yeah, yeah. in 2009, I was sitting up there having a panic attack while he's on stage. Because mm -hmm. my mom would say, look, you know, this will help you. We got to listen to, you know, positive things. You're going through this. You know, and I was negative because everything is, you know, happening, going the wrong way. And uh, she keeps on life in me, you know. And I was up there watching him because he was, he was one of the ones that really resonated at the time because he was just full of hope, you know. And... and I was a baby Christian, and I couldn't understand, like, real depth of theology of all the, you know, the Bible and stuff like that. He kept it on the surface level, just enough for me to understand it, to come to God. You know, it wasn't too deep that I couldn't understand what he was saying. Mm. You know, and it, it was full of hope and faith, and that's what I needed when I was going through that battle, man. So Joe played a massive role in what I'm doing today just because of that hope. So many times, man, I'd put that on and feel better. I mean, when I had panic attacks, man, it was, it's, you know, it was hell going mm. through those things. I put him on there and... I mean, I start feeling better, you know, just a little bit better. Not, you know, a lot, but a little bit. And a little bit's a lot when you ain't got nothing. So, man, um, I see my, my myself on that stage. I've been visualizing that for, for a couple of weeks now, just going over and over, seeing that crowd and doing that thing and pointing up there exactly where I was at up there. Mm. Right up there. I, the I, yeah, yeah, like I was right up there. And y'all could be, somebody here is now going through that, too. So remember, you know, this is nine, 2009. Took me a while, but God is faithful. God was still moving. What he did for me, he'll do for you. You know, I see that vision, man. I see them lights on me walking on that stage, you know. But five years, man, I see us coming back, hitting these arenas and, and taking this thing global. You know, we're we hitting the United States basically focusing right now. But this is a global message, and God is preparing. It's not letting us get ahead of ourselves. Like me, I wanted to stretch a little bit beyond that, but mm -hmm. also God's like, hold on now, let me prep you. There is a process. You know, there's a, you know, you got to sow first. You got to, you know, prep the ground. 
then I'm going to, you know, make this thing massive. But you've got to do your part. And our part is trusting him with the little numbers. If he can't trust us with 10 people, if somebody come to an event, 10 people come. If he can't trust us that, how are you going to trust us with, you know, 10 million? Right, right, right. So we have to be a good, faithful steward of every single person that he sent. If he just send one and sit them there and we have a thing, I'm going to rock it. I'm going to give that person my all because it don't matter about that. It's my identity. You know, if, do I only perform when we doing good? You know, like you 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 in the you in the league basketball league, and you know the playoffs is out the question. You got right, ten right. games left. Do you take off or you still you? You know what I mean? That's the question. Of course, of course. So me, it's it's like every time we get an opportunity like this, I'm coming to rock it, bro. We will stay here five hours if that's what you want, because I'm not gonna waste this opportunity. That's not what she wants. I know, I understand that on, on that <laughs> end, but like for me, that's my that's my identity. Like whatever you need it from me, of course, no, brother, that's what you got. And, and you know, Billy, I appreciate that, bro, and. Again, I mean, you know, your message is powerful. I think it applies, you know, religious, non-religious, just kind of the inherent spirit of people wanting right. to do better for themselves. Amen. Like wanting kind of to, to, to glow up and take that next level. So, That's right. brother, I appreciate your story. You give me this time meeting you. And you it's know, an honor to be here with you, you know bro. What I mean? I appreciate so it's, you. it's been great. And again, man, this is uh, Life Lessons from Motiversity. Uh, like I said, it's been an honor. The Dr. Billy Alls Brooks. Check him out on all socials with all your socials. Yeah, Billy Alls Brooks. Just add Billy yeah, Alls Brooks. Uh, everything. Billy Alls Brooks. Uh, yeah, bro. Appreciate you. Yeah, man. Yeah, let me say, like, I, let me end out like I always end out. First, yes. big time uh, shout out Justin over here. Hey. Big Frankie, uh, Global Films um, in the house too. Yes. But uh, we want to say this is Dr. Billy Alls Brooks, blessed and unstoppable, and to God be the glory. Oh.